Hello and welcome to Grace Lutheran Church Sermon Podcasts. On this podcast, you will hear the latest sermons taken from our weekly worship service. Our hope is that you will find joy and comfort in knowing the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. Our sermon is on Ezekiel 34, 25 to 31. You remember last week, the Lord said, I will shepherd my people, I will be with them, I will lead them, I will take care of them. And the priests were reprimanded. Well, in 1887, Anthony Showalter composed the hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. The hymn's refrain concludes, includes the famous words, safe and secure from all alarms. Safe and secure from all alarms. You know, all we hear these days are blaring, loud-sounding, heart-stopping alarms. We wake up to them. We hear them in the news. We hear them throughout the day. We go to sleep with alarms ringing in our ears. We don't know when COVID will end. It will take years to recover from the economy. Ding, 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 ding. Did you see what happened on Wall Street today? Ding, 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 ding. What is the future of our country so divided? Ding, 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 ding. Just to show you how much of alarmists we are, when you hear me say numbers are up, you're not thinking stock market or a baseball score, your mind immediately goes to COVID. So are the problems in our society. And you're alarmed, rightfully so. And fear accompanies being alarmed. And every, <clears throat> even beyond fear, there is one word that I think can sum up our alarmist and fearful reactions. We're a nation in pandemonium. In fact, pandemonium is the perfect word to describe our nation today. The word pandemonium was first used by English author John Milton in his book Paradise Lost back in 1667. Pandemonium, the place or abode of all demons, pandemonium. And if we look hard enough behind the physical and visible aspects of fear and alarm in this and other pandemics, the effect is actually spiritual. Fear and alarm, pandemonium, is spiritual warfare waged to assuage our faith, leaving us helpless and hopeless to lean only on our ever-flailing harms rather than on the everlasting arms of God. Satan's goal? pandemic pandemonium leads many to turn and run from God rather than to turn to God for safety. But safe and secure from all alarms is God's promise today through the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. We're in our second Sunday on our select passage of Ezekiel series called All Things New. This Sunday, we look at God's gift of a new covenant. And our text is from Ezekiel 34, beginning at verse 25. God is speaking. Listen to what he says. I will make a covenant of peace with them and will rid the land of wild beasts so that they can live securely in the wilderness and even sleep in the woods. First, God says, I will cut... And the Old Testament covenants weren't made, they were cut. Hebrew word is karat, and karat means to cut something. The English Bible translates cut as made a covenant. Hebrew, you cut a covenant. In the Old Testament, to enter into a relationship, people didn't sign their names. There were no attorneys. There were no notary publics, of course. There was blood, though. And in the Old Testament, to enter into an important relationship, people killed animals. They slit their throats, then poured out their blood. Covenant cutting was a messy business. God cuts the covenant 
with them. Who are the them? That's Israel from the verses before, over whom he is going to be their shepherd. He will establish a covenant with his rebellious people, Israel. Fifteen times in his book, Ezekiel calls Israel a rebellious house. To be a rebel doesn't mean you just sin or break a commandment. It means to take up arms against, to storm castles, to overthrow the king, in this case, Yahweh. Rebelling against God is to not place your faith and trust in him above all things. It's first commandment stuff. Rebellious means you choose a king, as the nation of Israel did, instead of being guided by God himself. Rebel is the strongest word for sin in the Old Testament. To not worship the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt, Israel is rebelling against God, the attempt to overthrow his authority and reign and live the way they wanted to, solve their own problems. In the New Testament, the equivalent of rebel is wretch. Wretch sounds so old-fashioned, but in Spanish, it's called miserable. I don't know if we can call it miserable. Wretch, I like the way it sounds. We're really not that bad, though, are we? Perhaps we're misguided. Perhaps we stray once in a while. We are prone to wander, as one hymn says. We're prone to make mistakes. But none of us is a wretch. Wretch is vile, debased, without morals. Romans 7, Paul writes, What a wretched man I am. Paul doesn't say, I was a wretch. He says, I am a wretch. What a wretched man I am right now, today, in pandemonium. <clears throat> As believers, truth be told, you and I, in fear and alarm, rebel and are wretches because we look more to safety and security in ourselves, guided by what we want to do, individually and as a nation. We don't look for safety and security in God. I wander from God, try to solve the problem on my own. I respond to my alarms and pandemoniums by doing things that make me feel secure and safe. Things that I do, things we do as a nation, politically, socially, medically. If you do not look to God first and foremost for safety and security amid the pandemonium that surrounds you, it's rebellion against God. It says, I can do better. Then God says in Ezekiel, a covenant, I will cut a covenant with them. God will cut a covenant with his rebellious and wretched people. You may think of a covenant as sort of a contract, but it's not. We understand a contract to be a secure and a legal way of holding both parties to their promise protection in doing business. It's pretty impersonal and it's legal. You don't have to trust someone because you have a contract that protects you. The truth is we use contracts simply because we don't trust each other. We need a contract to hold the other person accountable to their word. God's covenant is not a contract. God's covenant is not a business relationship. It doesn't have a beginning, it has a beginning date, it doesn't have a termination date. It simply doesn't, doesn't specify ifs or hidden clauses that he can get out of if things don't go right. God does not hold us accountable to our word in the covenant. In fact, we didn't have a word in the covenant. Ezekiel didn't. It's God's covenant with us. He holds himself accountable to his word, to his promise. God's covenant is a personal relationship that is everlasting. His covenant assures that all those who are in the covenant has his protection, security, and safety, his love, and his eternal salvation. 
He cannot and he will not break his covenant because he is a faithful God, faithful to his word, and has shown that to be true throughout history in the Old Testament. A covenant is established through blood, not the signing of papers. History testifies that God is always faithful to his covenant promises with his people. You remember in Genesis chapter 15, God cut his covenant with Abraham and his descendants, promising to make Abraham a great nation and protect them from any nation that seeks to harm them, including the 400 years of slavery in Egypt. His covenant was still valid and still in force. Genesis 17, two chapters later, makes it clear that this covenant is, as they call it, an everlasting covenant, Barit Olam. To seal this promise, Abraham was ordered to make a blood sacrifice. The blood is God's signature that he will be what he should be even when we're not what we should be. He will stay in the relationship no matter what. Out of faithfulness to his covenant with Abraham, God now cuts a covenant with Ezekiel. He calls it a covenant of peace. I will cut a covenant of peace with my people. We know from before, from other sermons, that peace is usually rendered in English. We think of it as a cessation or absence of conflict or an absence of war. But in Hebrew, peace is shalom, which means to be safe in body and soul, to be complete, to lack in nothing, to be fulfilled, to need nothing more. That's peace amid pandemonium. To have everything you need even in the abode of all demons or evil spirits. Perhaps you remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's peace among pandemonium. God is true to his covenant and makes you safe makes you secure, not lacking in anything that you might need. Now, episodes of evil in this world will alarm you. It will make you feel unsafe. They will jolt you and those around you, like the 10,000 French monks from decades ago, centuries ago, who stood in a row holding hands to see how fast electricity traveled from the first one to the last one. And when it was applied to the first man, they all jumped and screamed at the same time. And so, starting with just one infection in 2020, our society has been jolted. Our fear spread as if we were all holding hands and then suddenly the pandemic turned into pandemonium, affecting all aspects of our life. We turned on each other, laying blame as demons were unleashed from their abode to cause chaos and conflict. Well, what's gonna jolt you now? What's the next step in being afraid, in being fearful? The economy, your job, your investments, your health? When pandemonium sets in, people enter stampede mode, running in all different directions to find a way out, running over anything and everybody carelessly. Nobody matters but me. Pandemonium leads to desperate action. We look to anything and everything around us to hold on to as we drown in despair will do anything to feel secure. Masks, money, savings, stockpiling, buying gold and silver, vaccinating, isolating, violence, aggression. Everything in your power to find peace and safety. But rebellious and wretched people that we are, we look to God's covenant made to Ezekiel last, if at all. 
but it should be first. Hear what God promises in this covenant in Ezekiel 34, 25. Listen. He makes the covenant so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods where there were animals, obviously. That's where all dangerous evil spirits lived. They shall be secure in their land. They shall dwell securely and none shall make them afraid, safe and secure from all alarms. What a promise given to Ezekiel. I will cut with them a covenant of peace that is a covenant in which they lack nothing and are eternally safe. Well, what is that covenant today? And how does it affect you? And how is it fulfilled? After Jesus' resurrection, he says three times in John 20, peace or shalom be with you. Can you imagine what the disciples must have thought when Jesus said this? Shalom, really? So here's the cut covenant. Jesus is the covenant cut with us. Rebels and wretches. The risen Savior gives true peace to depose pandemonium. God cuts the new covenant in the blood of his son. In Gethsemane, Gabbatha, Golgotha, Christ signs, seals, and delivers the eternal and everlasting covenant for you. Signed in the Savior's cleansing blood, sealed by the Holy Spirit, delivered in the gospel, holy baptism, the Lord's Supper. These are the gifts of his covenant given to you and to me. We do nothing to deserve them. It's sort of a one-sided covenant. We add nothing to them to receive them except take and eat. After covenants were cut, the animal whose blood was spilled was eaten communally as one. This is what Christ does in the Lord's Supper. His is the blood of the new covenant. Not goats, not rams, not lambs, not pigeons, but God's own son is the covenant of peace, fulfilling his undying faithfulness. All prior covenants in the Old Testament find their fulfillment in Christ's blood. No more foreshadowing, no more in the future, no more pointing to the Savior. He is it. He is the covenant of peace that destroys all pandemonium, all abodes of the devil. He destroys Satan's hold on the world and grants peace and safety to all. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we participate in that covenant. We are the ones who, by eating the bread and wine, his body and blood, are taken into and receive the covenant promise. With his words given for you for the forgiveness of sins, he enters into that covenant with you and invites you to receive what his words promise, forgiveness of sins and eternal life, safety and peace in him. Nothing else prepares you to live in this world. Nothing else makes you whole. Nothing else brings you greater safety. You know, when my children were small, I became a playground on our living room floor in Guatemala. I'd put my knees up and I'd lay on my back and balance them on my hands and launch them up in the air with my legs and feet. And they called it Daddy Playground. What's amazing is that upside down or right side up, balancing on one foot, being spun around, the children giggled and screamed and wanted more. They weren't alarmed. They weren't afraid. It was not pandemonium. The children never questioned my judgment. They never doubted my saying, Dad, have you thought about this through? Dad, do you know what you're doing? Dad, how about first practicing with a pillow? My wife did, however, but they never did. Never once did they fear that I would drop them or that they would fall from my care. If Dad says he can, 
he can. If dad says he will, he will. He is our father. If God our heavenly father says he can, and if Christ our brother says he can, he can. And he did. If he says, take and eat my body and blood given and shed for you, it's because he has thought it through and chose to cut this covenant with you in this way. It's not something that we do to show our faith to others, nor do we do it to show our obedience to him. It is he who invites you in invitation to participate in that covenant meal, that eternal oath and covenant for the strengthening of your faith and invitation to rest in him for all your needs. Leaning on the everlasting arms, safe and secure from all alarms. If he, our Heavenly Father, says he can, he can. And if the Heavenly Father says he will, he will. Amen. To know more about Jesus and our ministry at Grace Lutheran Church, please find us at www.gracealoneonline.org. You'll find additional sermon podcasts and your favorite podcast channel every week at www.gracealoneonline.org forward slash sermons.